The tall stranger stood in the middle of the trail, his dusty black boots stuck into the ground, his shoulders tense. Hiding his colt, the stranger looked down at the ground, his eyes covered by the brim of his hat. His black hat matched the rest of his clothes. Black wool shirt, black gun belt, black denim pants, and black leather vest. In the midday sun, as the heat rose from the ground, the stranger seemed a wavering shadow. His horse bristled at the noise of two riders coming down the hill and approaching on the same trail. Snorting, the stranger's horse whipped his head around, his eyes following the approaching riders. Mister, you're standing in the middle of the road. Could you move a little? The rider waited for the stranger's answer, resting his hand on his six-shooter pistol. What do you think, Blair? Have you seen him before? His companion asked. Yeah, Dex, I've seen him before, the one called Blair said. He stared at the man in black, his right hand carefully removing the leather strap from the trigger guard of his dark blue Colt. Okay, who is he? Dex hissed, concern in his eyes. It's Chase Sanborn, Blair muttered, his hand hovering over the polished grip of the gun. Good God! God had nothing to do with it, growled the man in black, his hat slowly lifting, revealing pale blue eyes, eyes devoid of any emotion or mercy. What's the problem, Sanborn? Blair asked, keeping his eyes on the stranger's hand at the gun. Do you know a man named Jim Bartlett? Blair closed his eyes for a second. Yeah, I know him. Dex and I used to work for him, before he sent us packing. Wrongly accused us of deliberately losing part of his herd. He's dead. How? You should know you killed him, Sanborn said. Dex's eyes widened, and Blair stared at the dark-haired man. Damn it, I did it. When he told us to walk away, I was relieved. Bartlett was an angry, embittered old man, angrier, angrier than a cranky sidewinder. The man named Sanborn slipped his left hand under his vest, his right resting on the black steel strapped to his hip. Blair looked up, his hand reaching for his large, dark blue Colt. Dex stared in horror as his partner spun around in the saddle, a red mist erupting from the center of his chest. Blair, he screamed, grabbing for his gun. Two forty-five caliber bullets lifted him from the saddle. He landed in a cloud of dust in the middle of the trail, not far from the lifeless body of his comrade. Chase Sanborn stood motionless, staring at the carnage he had caused. He looked intently at the two men. Their horses had galloped away after the shooting, and now both bodies lay across the trail. Blair's gun clutched in his hand. Dakota snorted, his left front hoof scratching on the dirt. Sanborn turned and headed for the stallion. Without looking back, he grasped the saddle bow with his left hand, slid his left foot into the stirrup, and slid into the black leather saddle. He wasn't worried about the two corpses. It was a well-trodden path. With a loud snap and a twist of the reins, horse and rider galloped away. Why don't you get your nose out of that damn book and help around the house? She squealed. At least take out the damn garbage. Sometimes I think you love books more than you love your wife. Jack sighed and thought, at times, dear wife, at times, and put the book away. Damn woman, you're in rare form for a Saturday afternoon. I usually manage to read a couple chapters before you start screaming. He rose from his chair, staring at the novel he'd been devouring for the past two days. Good reading, he reflected. Gotta keep going. As he entered the kitchen, he heard M, short for Emma, fiddling around in the living room, moving furniture and everything else around to clean the house. He wrinkled his nose at the rattling and the sound of breaking glass. Indeed, a piercing shriek crashed into his skull. Oh, God, God, no. He knew better than to ask, than to give her another reason to point out how indifferent he was. What's wrong, sweetheart? Oh, Jack, my crystal flamingo slipped off the table and fell to the floor. It's shattered, she exclaimed. She was kneeling on the tiled floor, holding the largest remaining piece in her hands. Inwardly, he smiled. He hated that monster, but he knew it meant a lot to M. David Preston, her boss, had given it to her at the last corporate banquet. Thinking of Preston, Jack frowned. M's boss was a real messenger for shit and women. Jack knew Preston was always sniffing around M, always giving her gifts like that fucking crystal flamingo. Trying to sound as sincere as possible, Jack tried to calm his distraught wife. 
I'm so sorry, baby. I know how much you liked it. Wasn't it a gift from Preston? You know, the one from Santorini, Greece. M nodded, keeping most of the shards in a kitchen towel. Sniffling through her nose, she said quietly, Yes, yes, it was. But it wasn't the expense, it was the mood. Preston remembered how much I love flamingos. He's always good at it. Good at it? He asked a little too sternly. Emma turned and stared at her husband. He's good at what you seem to lack. He always knows what I like, she grumbled. Of course he always knows what you like, Emma. He's desperate to be in your cute little panties. At that moment, Jack realized he was in the shit. Shit, it's too late now. Emma's eyes narrowed so much that Jack could barely see those precious green irises, her face taking on an ugly reddish yellow hue that almost blended in with her red hair. You shit, you bastard, you jealous asshole. You never liked David, you never gave him a chance. You always believe the worst about people and think he's always trying to seduce me. Well, I'll tell you something right now, Mr. Jackson. It's going to be a long time before you see those, as you say, pretty little panties again. A hell of a long time. In fact, sleep in the guest room tonight. The rage that had long simmered inside him reared its ugly head, and Jack couldn't help but smile and laugh. He knew it would only add fuel to the fire of the furnace known as Emma Marie Lee. Damn, Em, I can't remember the last time I saw those panties you think so highly of. Damn woman, you know. I'm thinking about the fact that we haven't slept together in what, maybe two, three months? I, making love? Hell, I don't think we've made love in the last six months. Maybe hell, maybe someone else was the lucky recipient of your latent affection. You sure aren't getting anything from your loving husband now, are you? And God knows I've tried. Jack grinned and continued. A guest room. I don't think so, sweetheart. As a great philosopher once remarked, don't do it. If you don't want to sleep with your husband, you can move into the guest room. Staring at her husband, Emma blinked, her face pale and quickly losing the red blush of anger. Her eyes widened, revealing those beautiful dark emerald eyes that Jack loved so much. A tear appeared in the corner of her right eye as she realized what her husband had just said. He had never spoken to her in this manner before, and she was shocked at his anger and resentment. Then the realization of what he had just accused her of hit her, and she jumped up, ran out of the room, and ran down the hall. A few seconds later, Jack grimaced when he heard the bedroom door slam and wondered for a moment if she'd locked herself out. Damn it, why couldn't I just keep my big mouth shut? He wondered. I can see why, you idiot. This has been going on for far too long, he replied hoarsely to himself. Soon he calmed down enough to contemplate a very unpleasant thought. She did not deny it. She did not deny the accusation of adultery. Suddenly his heart dropped as he became anxious, which meant no denial. Jack sat down and contemplated his next move. His wife was in the bedroom, no doubt crying her eyes out, and here he was, wondering what would happen next. At that moment, it occurred to him that his wife hadn't actually said she was cheating on him. Jack stood up and walked down the hallway. He saw that their bedroom door was open and assumed that she must have run to the guest room. However, that door was open as well. But the bedroom door of Amelia, their eldest daughter, was closed. Walking quietly to the door, he listened and heard his wife sobbing. Knocking gently, he spoke softly. Um, could we talk? Emma sniffed her nose and mumbled hesitantly. Please leave me alone. Ia, I'll be fine. Just give me a few minutes. As angry as he was, it broke Jack's heart to hear her speak so sadly, so miserably. Then it's okay. If and when you want to talk, let me know. There was no answer, and he turned to leave as she continued to cry. Shit, he muttered. It was about six in the evening when Emma went in search of her husband. She found him sitting next to his desk in the garage with the door open and Jack watching the surroundings. She stood in the doorway and looked at her husband sitting there. He had that look she knew so well. He was deep in his thoughts, and who knows where he was at that moment. She dreaded the answer. Jack? She called out in almost a whisper. Jack turned and looked at his wife, and a deep sadness came over him like a great wave crashing onto the beach. 
He knew he loved her more than anything in the world, and despite their problems, he treasured this woman. Yes, Em? Can we talk now? A lazy, crooked grin spread across his face, and he nodded. Sure. Why not? She couldn't help but smile at the man she'd married 21 years ago, just as handsome but with a few wrinkles around his eyes and a little more gray on his temples. Jack's deep brown eyes had always been mischievous, humor and love shining in them. Oh, why couldn't he have been more attentive to her needs like David, she thought. Thinking of David Preston made her blush, feeling guilty. Jack noticed the guilty look flashed across her face. Why should she feel guilty? He slowly got up from his stool and walked over to her. Emma noticed the change in his eyes and became nervous. Maybe now wasn't the right time for them to talk. Well, let's get this over with, Jack said. He had expected the worst. Okay, she replied timidly. Together, they walked out to the backyard where she sat on a covered swing the length of the couch. Jack looked at her and asked, would you like some coffee? Nodding, she smiled and replied, sounds good. He went inside, turned on the coffee maker, and as he waited, he carefully watched his wife sitting on the swing, slowly rocking back and forth. Looking at M sitting on the swing, Jack thought of the girls. They were both in school. Emilia had followed her mother's example to Berkeley, and Jackie was attending Washington State University. Since the girls had left home, the family had become tense. Jack was immersed in work, and Emma was also more involved with Preston and Sons, a prestigious law firm specializing in civil law and big business. Emma was the personal assistant to Douglas Emmett Preston's son, David Preston. Tall, blonde, with dark gray eyes, he had the confidence and predatory instincts to become a very successful civil attorney. And Emma was his latest prey, Jack was sure of it, even if Emma didn't believe it. He knew she could be so naive at times. There was growing friction between them as she became more and more immersed in her work, and Jack could see his wife growing more distant every day. Jack poured coffee into two cups and took them outside, giving one to his wife. Thank you, she whispered, taking the hot cup. Anytime, he replied and she looked at him for a moment before shifting her gaze to the mass of purple, red, and orange bougainvillea growing along the back wall. Jack sat down on a stool next to the swing and waited. Sipping the hot black brew, he stared up at the sky, watching the lone jet leave a wide white trail of steam across the vast blue sky, the only speck in its expanse. Jack, yeah, I'm sorry. Jack swallowed and looked into his coffee, a thin trickle of steam rising from the dark brown liquid. What are you talking about? She closed her eyes and sipped from her cup before answering his question. For making you think I was cheating, I didn't, well, not physically, I guess. Not physically? She turned and stared intently at her husband, looking into his deep brown eyes. I've never had sex with him, but I've, uh, been with him. Jack didn't say anything, just watched the many expressions flicker across her face. She'd never been good at hiding her feelings. He's asked me out to dinner several times. The last two requests I, I accepted. You were in Anchorage at the time. Do you remember the three weeks you were away? Jack nodded. Coincidentally, it had been three months ago when he'd noticed the chill appearing between them. He'd been sent to Alaska to check out a possible oil spill and increased toxicity in the Gulf, as well as any environmental effects. He always called her every day he was away and could pinpoint the exact moment she spoke differently on the phone. She seemed agitated, a guilty note in her voice. I remember. You sounded different on the phone, like something was bothering you. Yeah, I felt guilty after that first time. I. Last week, he asked me out again. I knew I shouldn't have accepted his invitation, but I said yes. But, uh, you didn't feel guilty after the second dinner? Did you have a good time? Was he everything you thought he'd be? Was he better than your humble husband? Jack, stop it. Yes, I enjoyed the evening, and he was a gentleman the whole time. We were just talking. Talking? Emma paused and stared into her coffee cup. Yes, we were just talking. She knew the next question. About what? About everything. 
We talked about the law firm, about my future, about me and you. We talked about girls. What about you and me? He wanted to know how things were going between the two of us. David told me that the firm was thinking of promoting me to the position of executive manager of the firm, and he wanted to know how good our family life was. So? Emma turned away, looking up at the sky. I told him that you and I had some issues to work out. I told him... Told him what, Emma? I told David that I think you believe that your job, your career, is more important to you than your family. More important than me. I'll bet you ten to one, Emma. He suggested that I was probably having an affair, didn't he? At first she was about to deny that Preston had said those exact words, but she nodded and said, Yes, he did say it. But please believe me, Jack. I never thought about it for a second. I know you'll never have an affair. You'll never cheat on me. He didn't say anything else. Anything else? I could hear the irritation in his voice. Emma closed her eyes for a moment before continuing. Yes, he asked me to accompany him on a business trip to Vancouver. You know what he wants, don't you, Emma? Jackson Lee, you always think the worst of people. He needs me to go with him to be his assistant during important negotiations. It's part of my new duties as executive manager. Her face flashed with anger. It was a common occurrence for Emma lately. Okay, Emma, I get it. You've had dinner with this man twice, and now he wants you to go with him. For how long? She looked down and quietly replied, three days. So what do you want from me, my blessing? I don't need your blessing, Jack, but I wanted you to realize that this is just business. I know I was wrong to agree to have dinner with him without telling you. That's why I'm telling you now. Jack just stared at Emma. She was very cocky, that was for sure. Well, it was time to finish her off. Okay, do it. Do whatever you want, Emma. Obviously, whatever I think means shit to you. It doesn't. Let me finish. And yes, it's true. For the past six months, we've barely been a loving couple. I don't know why. Yes, I've been very busy with this latest project in Alaska, but before you always understood me, suddenly everything changed and not for the better. I found out you've been on two dates. Oh, you're apologizing for not telling me, but you obviously don't regret going out with that jerk. Oh, great. Here's the deal. You're going on your three-day business trip. I think I might have a few dinners with a friend myself. Maybe even take a business trip back to Alaska. I think Marie would like to finally get some field experience. Emma stared at her husband. Marie? Yes. You remember Marie? She's that new environmental engineer we hired. You met her at the last picnic. Long blonde hair, blue eyes. Remember. Emma did remember. Marie was gorgeous and young. And she remembered how the girl kept talking and talking about how much she had learned from Jack. You can't be serious. You're only saying that to make me jealous. So why would I do that? Obviously, I shouldn't be jealous of this jerk right now, should I? No, of course not, she said a little too quickly. Damn him, she thought. All she wanted was to be alone with herself and enjoy the attention of a man who knew how to treat a woman. She wasn't going to do anything but have dinner with this man. But here was Jack saying exactly what she was saying, and she could feel the seeds of jealousy sprouting inside. All right, if that's how he wanted to play it. All right, do what you think is best, Jack. I'm leaving this Friday, and I'll be back Monday. Wow, a little early, Emma. Not much for advance notice. Hey, do me a favor before you go on that business trip. What? Make sure you're up to date on birth control. I don't want to feed someone's little mouth. And make him use a condom. You don't want to catch any diseases. Boiling with anger, Emma finished her coffee and stood up. I'd better start packing my things, she grinned wryly. Jack didn't answer. He watched his wife enter the house. Boiling with anger, he stayed outside. Without warning, he roared and hurled his coffee cup at the wall, shattering the china into pieces. Damn that woman, he muttered under his breath. Thursday night was arctic in the house. It didn't matter that it was midsummer with typical California weather, warm and windy. It was frosty between husband and wife. Jack and Emma hardly spoke to each other. She was angry at her husband 
and Jack acted as if he didn't care, largely ignoring her and her feelings. Early Friday morning, Emma woke up and immediately realized she was alone. Usually, she always woke up first and made coffee, but this time Jack wasn't there. When she glimpsed his side of the bed, she noticed that his blanket had been pulled up and his pillow was gone. An icy fear pierced her as she realized Jack was awake in bed. Damn it, Jack, where are you? She muttered, throwing back the covers and sliding off the mattress. Searching for her husband, she found his pillow on the bed in the guest room. There was clearly someone sleeping on the bed, but Jack wasn't in the room. She quickly went into the kitchen and found the coffee maker empty. Damn, you didn't even bother to make coffee? Jack, Jack. There was no reply, and she became worried. Back in the bedroom, she noticed a half sheet of paper leaning against their wedding picture on the dresser. She grabbed the sheet and saw that it was written in her husband's handwriting. Emma, I'm sorry I won't be able to see you off. I hope you enjoy your time with David Preston. I'm sure he will take good care of you, better than me, as you probably think. Well, I think you need that kind of attention. By the way, who besides David Preston has talked to you about this new position? Oh, and speaking of David, I have to admit I almost confronted this piece of crap about inviting a very married woman, my married woman, to dinner without her husband's knowledge. But I decided he wasn't the problem. The problem was you. It was your decision to accept both invitations. It was your choice not to tell me. And now you've decided to go away with him for three days. All he did was wave a carrot around. You're the one who took the bait. And then I'm going away for a week, so I won't be home when you get back from your little interlude. I'll be in Valdez. Last minute company request, sorry for the short notice. If there's an emergency, call me on my cell phone. By the way, when I get back, we have to sit down and discuss who gets what and what to tell the girls. Have fun with Preston, Jackson Nathan Lee. Ooh, what an asshole, she screamed, crumpling up the piece of paper and throwing it at the wall. I'm just willing to bet he's taking Marie with him, she spat out. Fuck him, two can play at that. She stopped halfway through her sentence. Sit down and see who gets what. What do I tell the girls? What the hell? She knew exactly what he meant. She flopped down on the bed and stared at the crumpled piece of paper. Tears flowed as she realized Jack was telling her it would be over if she went with Preston. Then she thought of Marie and her husband, and her eyes narrowed, and her eyebrows frowned. That's not going to happen, she thought. The airplane slowly approached the VA aviation terminal. As soon as the plane came to a stop, Jack and Marie gathered their carry-on luggage and jumped out of the 12-seat plane. Half an hour later, they were standing in the lobby of the Best Western Hotel. Marie stepped aside as Jack checked in at the front desk. When he returned, he handed her the key and grabbed her luggage. Entering the elevator, they headed for the room. When Marie got off on her floor, Jack watched her walk out, dragging her travel bag behind her. He wondered how she would act tomorrow. They were to explore the waters of Port Valdez through Valdez Strait, which flowed into Prince William Strait so it promised to be a long and busy day. Later, sitting in a chair by the hotel room window, he looked out over Port Valdez. It's really beautiful here, he thought. An image appeared in his mind, Emma looking at him with her green eyes. Why, he muttered, why would she do that? Marie, take the bucket. Make sure it's strapped down before you collect samples. Marie Lassonde nodded and biting her lower lip, lifted the heavy bucket from the swaying deck and shuffled to the railing, dragging the nylon rope behind her. Ready? She nodded and Jack said, okay, go ahead. She tossed the clear plastic bucket overboard, hearing a splash as it hit the surface of the churning sea. The bucket immediately disappeared beneath the waves. She immediately grabbed the rope. With all her might, she was able to pull the bucket to the surface, but ran into trouble dragging the bucket along the hull. Here, let me help you. Jack exclaimed, putting his arm around the diminutive woman and pulling on the rope. With his help, she was able to pull the bucket onto the deck. Good job, Marie. By the way, never be afraid to ask for help. Okay? Nodding, she muttered, okay, Jack. A few hours later, they headed for port, getting dozens of water samples from the Prince William Strait and Narrow Strait areas and finally Port Valdez. How's it going? 
Jack asked, watching Marie rubbing her hands through her thick coat. I'm fine. A little cold, I guess. Damn it, woman, I'm freezing too. I can only imagine how you're coping. Mari smiled, her face almost completely hidden under a thick hood lined with fur. She sat on the bench in the deckhouse while Jack steered the 55-foot boat into the bay. He stared intently at the shoreline of the strait as he steered the vessel. Her naked cheeks flushed brightly as she breathed in the cold air. When she exhaled, she saw a vaporous mist of breath drift off her lips. Jack looked back at her and said, We'll be back at the hotel soon. Just think about enjoying a nice hot spa. Damn, I can't wait, Jack, she wheezed, and she really couldn't wait. All she could think about was being with Jack Lee. She knew he was married, but at the moment she didn't care. Jack and Marie had become close friends, and she knew that there were constant problems between Jack and his wife. She had noticed that for the past three weeks he had been quiet, not as happy and cheerful as he used to be. Then, all of a sudden, he had to go to Alaska and survey the surrounding waters for oil spills and toxicity levels. She was surprised when he asked if she wanted to do some field work, and she quickly jumped at the chance to accompany him. Maybe this was the time when she would finally be able to crack his stone exterior. God knows she'd already tried, but he never took a hint. A smile slid across her frozen lips as she thought, maybe tonight is the night. Securing the boat, they collected the samples and placed them in the lab before returning to the hotel. Once back, Mary and Jack entered the elevator. The doors closed, and they began to ascend. Jack? Yes, Mary? Am I attractive? What? Caught off guard, Jack could only stare at this gorgeous creature. She wasn't just attractive, she was downright dangerous. Uh, yes, yes, you're very beautiful. Are you sure? He could see the longing in those big blue eyes. Yes, Marie, you're a very beautiful girl, in fact, a beautiful young woman. She moved closer to him. Her large parka was unbuttoned, revealing a taut body beneath a thick sheath. Do you find me pretty? He knew where this was going. To himself, he smiled. If he hadn't been married, he would have done anything to have this incredible creature look down on him, but he was married and he still loved Emma. Marie, I find you extremely attractive and very dangerous to an old married man like me. I know things haven't been going well between you and Emma lately, Jack. I want you to realize that I'm here for you anytime, anywhere, any way you want me to be. Jack, I really like you, and I find you very, very attractive. I'm not asking for a commitment. I just want you to know that, uh, I'm here for you. With those words, she walked over to him, stood on tiptoe, and kissed him gently on the lips. The elevator stopped and the doors opened. Standing at the door, preventing the elevator from going up, she stared at him. She reached out and ran her fingers gently down his cheek, touching his two-day stubble. After a couple seconds, she said, You know my room number. She stepped out of the doorway and let the elevator close, her passionate blue eyes remaining on him as the doors closed. Oh my God, he exhaled as the elevator continued to the next floor. Jack knew Marie liked him, but not to this extent. Shit, he thought, I'm in trouble. I have at least three more days with this woman. At that, he couldn't escape the image of those well-built breasts straining against her red cotton cape as she unbuttoned her parka. Entering his room, he threw off the parka and pulled his wool-knit shirt over his head. Damn it, I should have seen this coming, he reprimanded. He walked into the bathroom and turned on the hot water. Damn it, I should have taken a cold shower instead of a hot one, he muttered as his little brain went into overdrive, harder than it had ever been in a long time. Undressing, he tested the water and stepped into the shower. He could feel the fullness of her breasts against his back. Oh shit, he thought, how the hell did she get here? Marie, I'm so sorry, I can't do this, I'm happily married to, he stopped short, turning to face her. Marie? I don't think so, Buster. You're mine and you'll always be mine, okay? Emma, how? I, uh, I thought you were in Vancouver with Preston. He stared at her naked figure standing in front of him his eyes tracing the water that flowed over and around her stunning breasts. 
He looked into the green eyes, eyes that glistened with lust. There are some things more important than business trips, more important than fraudulent promotions. You were right about David Preston. We'll talk about that later. I'm so sorry, Jackson Nathan Lee, my sweet husband. Can you ever forgive me for being such a stupid bitch? Uh, uh, since you have a good grasp of the, uh, situation, yeah, I forgive you. If you can forgive me. Mmm, she moaned, pressing her naked body against her husband. That feels so good. Forgive you for what, darling? For not thinking of us. Emma, you are the most important thing in my life, not work. I didn't make that clear. My stubbornness prevented me from showing the love I have for my family, for my wife. Please forgive me. She looked into the big brown eyes and saw love and care in them. Smiling, she slowly sank to her knees, her belly and breasts sliding over his wet skin. She looked up again, smiling at his wide open eyes. Oh my God. He exhaled as she sucked him to the base, nestling her nose into his hair. Emma, I, uh, I'm going to... She didn't stop, and she didn't let him go. Emma. Shh. I wanted this, husband. I wanted you to know that I was yours and yours alone. He bent down and picked her up. Holding her tightly against him, he pressed his lips to hers, his tongue wrapped around her tongue. Jack could taste himself, but he didn't care. All he knew was that he loved this woman. After they toweled themselves dry and continued their renewed lovemaking on the bed, there was a faint knock on the door. Jack knew who it was, and obviously his wife knew too. Afraid of her reaction, he glanced up at her. She smiled and whispered, Hold this for me. Hold it for me. I'll only be a second. Now, grabbing her robe, she strode to the door and looked through the peephole. Marie had showered and put on her sexiest outfit without a bra, wearing a bright red tight sleeveless pullover over a very short white skirt. She knew it was brave of her to go to his room, but the young girl had planned it all out and knew this was her big chance. She smiled as the door opened. However, her eyes widened in shock when a beautiful red-haired woman peeked out from behind the door. Marie, it's so nice to see you. I'm so sorry, but Jack is not well at the moment and will continue to be unavailable. Do you understand? Marie couldn't say anything. She nodded and stared at the gorgeous red-haired woman with the piercing green eyes. Smiling, Emma closed the door. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath. She realized how close she was to losing the only man she had ever loved. After reading his note, she realized what she needed to do. First, she called David Abrams, Jack's boss, and quickly arranged a flight to Valdez, Alaska. Next, she called Douglas Emmett Preston and asked about the executive director position offered to her by his son, David. Mr. Preston knew nothing about it. When she explained to Mr. Preston what David had told her, he became apologetic. He told her that she was a very valuable asset to the firm and would not want to lose her. Nevertheless, she notified him of her decision to leave the firm. Mr. Preston said he understood and promised to write an enthusiastic recommendation for her. She then decided she would wait before telling her husband about leaving Preston and Sons. Emma turned and headed back to the bed, her husband lying there just as she had left him. He watched her approach and a smile could be seen on his face as she pulled the robe off her shoulders, letting it fall to her feet on the floor. Climbing onto the bed, she removed his hand, replacing it with her own. Looking into his eyes, she whispered, I love you, husband. He looked lovingly into her eyes and said quietly, Love you, wife. 